Welcome to the Writer Talks. Hope this month of March has begun on a note of positivity, impelling you to march ahead regardless of the oddities of life. Yes, it has been a year into the pandemic, a year into lockdown, COVID and social distancing, with life and our world changing definitively. In fact, it wouldn't be an exaggeration to state that it has been a year where the surreal and the real have intersected so significantly. My guest today, the melodious, multifaceted wordsmith from Sydney, Wendy Waters, dabbles extensively with the real and the surreal seamlessly in all her works. She epitomizes Samuel Coleridge's concept of poetic faith or the willing suspension of disbelief as her characters connect, interact, and emote with the supernatural just as naturally as with the ones in our world. In her debut novel, Catch the Moon Mary, as well as in the recently published and highly acclaimed novel, Fields of Grace, set in the backdrop of World War II, Wendy blends this interaction between the here and the hereafter, the real and the surreal, so convincingly and so seamlessly. This gifted writer, a former theater artist, watch her remote as she reads excerpts from both her novels, is also a brilliant librettist with three exceptional musicals to her credit. Music is a constant motive in all her works. Wendy is also an award-winning writer and her debut novel is Catch the Moon Mary is being woven into a screenplay for an adaptation. This impeccable wordsmith, living in a serene, idyllic part of Sydney, loves to travel and she admits to devoting her time between London, Paris and Sydney. So without further ado, let's dive in and listen to this mesmerizing musical writer speak about lyrics, publishing, angels, muses, her passion and inspiration besides a host of other things. But before that, please like, share and subscribe to the Writer Talks. Thank you all for showing so much support. Please continue to encourage your friends to subscribe so that we can continue this literary engagement with brilliant writers from across the world. Do write in your thoughts and suggestions in the comment section. On the occasion of International Women's Day on March 8th, I am dedicating today's episode to all the women of substance. Happy Women's Day and cheers to all the women living with courage and conviction, the pillars of confidence. I hope you enjoy watching the wonderful Wendy speak with me on the Writer Talks. Until next week, stay happy, write, reflect, and keep the faith. For as Wendy says, there is a higher power looking over you. Take care. Ahoy. Ahoy. Welcome, Ahoy. Wendy Waters, the brilliant writer from Sydney. And more than that, uh, such a fabulous mentor and member of the writing community. Not only are you an accomplished novelist, but uh, another unique feather in your cap is that you are a librettist and uh, with three musicals to your credit, Alexander, The Last Tale, and Fred. Welcome to the Writer Talks. Right. I am very happy to be here. And thank you so much for being patient with me. Um, and thank you. I want to thank Brian Quinn for introducing us. The sure. author of No Good Deed Goes Unpunished and um, The Package. Uh, he's such a he's such a generous, talented man. And yeah, he introduced us. So I'm very happy to finally be here and talking Absolutely. to you. Delighted to see you in person, <laughs> virtually in person, so to say. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'll begin by asking you about your uh, musical genius that you are. I ah, genius. Asking you about you being a librettist. What got you interested in this? What what, what was the inspiration of the librettist? <laughs> what was um, okay, well, I started life as, a, as an actress and, and a singer um, and a terrible dancer, unfortunately. And a lot of the musicals that were coming through when I was very, very young were needing or requiring triple threats. And a triple threat is someone who can sing, dance and act. Um, I can sing and I can act and I can, I can barely put one foot in front of the other successfully. So... My dancing really let me let me down, unfortunately. And so, as I was saying before, as the years kind of peeled away and I was observing these marvellous musicals coming through and, and um, 
I don't, I, I don't know exactly at what point, but somewhere along the line, I thought I'm going to try and write. Um, I started with just lyrics. I'm going to try and write lyrics. And as I was saying a little earlier to you, you're a brilliant poet, as is this wonderful lady, Akila. Yes. Just put the have. I keep it by my bedside because I just I am so blown away by her work. So Akila Israel, I I can't write poetry, but for some reason when I can hear or think of the musical or imagine it in a musical form, I can write lyrics. So, yeah, that's how it started. And for lack of a composer, we've, um, my very first musical was Scheherazade, based on the teller of the Arabian tales. And I had to write the music myself, which was very frightening. And because I, because of my history, my background as an actress, it was quite um, a natural flow to write the book, which is basically a play. So I knew how plays looked and I knew how they should arc and form. So, yeah, and I interpolated the uh, play with, with lyrics, which I then had to write the music to. Very frightening. And th but then I was very lucky. I met a magnificent composer called Shannon Whitelock, who is truly, truly, I believe, is going to be one of the great world-beating composers. His his music is extraordinary. And we met quite by accident because his parents ran into my car. <laughs> so, yeah, they ran into my car. And um, naturally, as you do when you're standing by the side of the road <laughs> waiting for the NRMA, to, that's our, our service that comes and helps you <laughs> with your smashed up car. Um, we started talking about musicals. <laughs> and, and so I met their son who then said to me, um, why don't we pull our resources and try and um, rework Scheherazade, which is a fantastic subject. She's extraordinary. And she's so strong and colourful and wonderful and, you know, a feminist. And, and um, he said, and I'll write the music because, because I can do it better than you. <laughs> I said, I agree. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> Ah, <laughs> oh, men, gotta love them, honey. And then um, <laughs> he said, but your, <laughs> but your lyrics are outstanding. I said, oh, thank you for that. Thank you so much. So then we started, we started writing together and that became the last tale, that wow. transition from Scheherazade to the very last tale. Um, so it's the last tale Scheherazade ever tells is the last tale. Before she gets her freedom, her freedom. Um, the other two musicals that you mentioned were Alexander and Fred. So these ones I've done, I, I've written the music myself. <laughs> okay, and Alexander is based loosely on the life of Alexander the Great because it's got everything. It's got everything. He conquers the world and then he dies. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what you need. Conquer the world, then die. Okay, thank you. That's my ending. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, you gave me that. Yeah, you gave me God. <laughs> yeah, yeah, God on earth. Very good looking. Dies young. Excellent. Not too complicated. Wonderful. Um, and Fred, look, Fred came out of a conversation with... Um, with a friend of mine, um, she's quite extraordinary. She lives alone in a flat, in apartment, uh, which is flat, you know, in Sydney. And it's a massive apartment building. And I mean, there's, I don't know, 30, 40 people there. And I, I said to her one day, oh, so the lady across the way, um, what, or the person across the way, sorry, I didn't say lady specifically, person across the way, what do they do? She said, I've never met them. I've never met them. I've been here 20 years and I've never met my neighbours. I said, 20 years and you've never met, never run into in the hall, you know. 
the garbage, taking other garbage, it hasn't happened. And she said, no, isn't it disgraceful? I said, it's awful that you don't know your neighbours, any neighbours. Um, so I, then I thought, well, yeah, you know, that's crowded cities. That's the way so many people live, alone, and they don't know the next-door neighbour. This is not healthy. <laughs> this is not this is not functional. So um, I wrote Fred about three ladies, very lonely, very um, lost in fantasy, and they live in adjoining apartments and they have never met. <laughs> and, and so the device, you know, the, the power in the building fails and an electrician called Fred comes in to fix it. And I sort of had to um, cheat it a bit that he went into each apartment and got to talk to each of these women. So then you've got that wonderful song that comes out of explaining to him what their lives are like. And um, as, as he's fixing the fuses, he also comes up with a scheme to, to bring them together and to um, help them be friends and open their hearts and their doors to each other, which they do. So it's really heartwarming. It's really, it's a lovely it's show. It's so riveting. I mean, it's so contemporary and completely related. Yeah. I, I've lived in Bombay for nearly 13 years and I can completely understand this not meeting neighbours. Yep. Right. About that. Yep. Gosh. Yep. And and um, exactly, you don't you don't meet your neighbours. We don't live in a in a tribal way anymore. We don't live in a in a healthy community way. You know, um, it's it's tragic what what we've lost as as a society the whole world over. We've lost that sense of place in a tribe, place in a community, and even going well. My nearest neighbour, I don't know anything about. And um, yeah, I, I just, I think, I hope the world redresses that through through co with COVID. I hope we can emerge with a more compassionate understanding of the need that we have for each other, you know, rather than this. I think much much of the depression and loneliness can be battled if we can only establish this kind of connect rapport. And support, yeah, we're humans. We have human needs, and and they include um, caring about other people, and and they include um, uh, emotional availability and emotional responsibility. It's not just financial. You, you know, giving a check to charity <laughs> is not quite the same as actually saying, "How are you?" You know, what do you need? and I'll, I'll talk to you, you know, I'll give, spend some time with you. It's much more precious. Now, um, how, how different is it writing musicals from writing fiction? Uh, what, what, what are the challenges? I actually, they're very, very different um, uh, disciplines, obviously. I find writing... Um, Lyrics, the if I can say that it's the easiest of all of the things that I do. Like I, perhaps I love it the most. <laughs> maybe and I just love writing lyrics. So that's that flows because I'm willing. I think it's because I have a massive willingness to do that, and I'll, I'll put the time in. And particularly when um, working with Shannon, when he sends me the music, it's like. Uh, can hear phrases, I can hear the ideas, I can hear the flow. So that's a very di different discipline. Writing um, the book of a musical, yeah, that's tough. That's that's really hard. And um, they say, uh, people, um, so Tim Rice uh, said that writing the book of a musical, which he's never done, by the way, it's ever, <laughs> is the most difficult thing in theatre. And a lot of people say that if a musical fails, it's often because of the book which is the libretto, um, operatic, that's the, the words that are spoken. Um, well, a libretto is also the words that are sung, you know, when they're sung in recitative, recit recit I can't say it, recitative, you know, any sort of sing a sentence. Pass me the salt, 
you want it now. No, I want it then. <laughs> Which basically is just a conversation <laughs> set to a little bit of music. So it's also in opera that's libretto as well. But it's the conversation part. Um, writing novels. Oh, I think it's really hard. Really, really, really difficult. And it's big. It's a big project. It's years. Yeah, it's years. It's research. It's getting every word right. <sighs> um, <laughs> oh, what did uh, Truman, Truman Capote said, every novel takes five years off your life. <laughs> I think I think it does. I think it takes the five years to write it, and then it, it docks another five years at the end, out of stress. It's not that when it's finished, it's like wow. I mean, the most monumental achievement you've written, you know, eighty to one hundred and twenty thousand words. Oh my goodness told this whole story and develop these people out of your own imagination yeah that's extraordinary it's a wonderful achievement it feels great when you put finished absolutely <laughs> you find the cover. especially yeah. so much time and so much devotion to that yeah speaking of uh, speaking of the number of years no i, I mean i think that your debut novel catch the moon mary the story mm. behind uh, its publication itself is a page turner. I, I, I mean, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I have Catch the moon, Mary. Yeah. For, for another book. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, would, would you like to tell us how you eventually got to publishing it? Yeah. Um, Catch the moon, Mary. Yeah. I was um, I was volunteering at Oasis, which is a crisis centre for homeless youth. So you had to, the cutoff point uh, for the kids that came to Oasis was 25. So after 25, they literally had to go, which was really, really hard. Um, I did some uh, work there as a music teacher. So <laughs> a singing teacher, not, not I can't, yeah, not music per se. So a singing teacher and the stories that the kids were telling me about how they coped with being homeless, some of them, believe it or not, Asha, from the age of seven. So, yeah, and I, I remember walking with one little kid and he showed me a tiny little hole in the wall in the middle of Sydney um, so that's where I slept when I was seven, eight, nine, ten, you know. Um, yeah, it, it's it's very difficult to, to get your head around how these people, how they've even survived. But a lot of them told me stories about um, having uh, what they felt were guardian angels or um, imaginary friends and these Entities became very important to them because this was their company, this was their point of um, reflection, this was their point of dialogue. You know how we would go and talk to friends or, yeah, different people. Um, they would talk to their imaginary friends or their guardian angels. So that's how the idea for Catch the Moon Mary came about. And um, and not all of these entities, of course, were positive. The way I approached that was a whole different story. Have you? It took a lot of polishing, a lot of redrafting, and many many years of redrafting to get this idea of a of a grounded angel or an earthbound angel. Anyway, let's just say uh, mentoring a very very gifted but abused young woman, young girl. So to get him not to be preachy and to get him to be um, authentic, it, it took me a lot of redrafts and a lot of thinking. And um, so when I finished it, I got it to the point where I thought, yeah, okay, now is the time to pitch it to publishers. This, because it's so unusual, I thought, oh, this won't, this won't be hard. <clears throat> Seven years later <laughs> and pitching, yeah, all around the world to any publisher who would take and 
unagented, unrequested, um, uh, not um, you know, uh, submission. <sighs> was it was getting very very narrow and every day I was opening up my inbox and seeing another rejection so and you start to re you start to to lose confidence in yourself that do I have this story on you know do I have it really so I actually revisited the story and did another you know another couple of drafts and had it assessed redrafted and then started the whole process of pitching again and it was a tiny little publisher in Scotland um Linen Press who Lynn Mitchell came back to me and said look this is very different I quite I'm peaked um can you send me the next 100 pages which is about half the book and I did and she came back and said um, I think it's the the prose is a little bit overwritten. So I said, okay. So then I went back and sort of streamlined the prose. You've got to be you've got to be able to take criticism. You've got to be able to take it in and and sort of go is is does this chime with me or not? And it, it's it did it did. So anyway, I did all of that and then I went back to her. I said, right, I've done what you asked and would you take another look? And so she picked it up. That was in 2015. And um, she edited the entire book almost line by line, did an incredible job, absolutely. But the great thing about Lynn was that she got me. You know, she got where I was coming from. She got what I was trying, trying to say. Um, she understood the angel. She understood the child. She understood it was she was superb, and um, so that was launched in two fifteen in the UK. I flew over there and had a wonderful time, a couple of weeks. You know, I absolutely love London. It was brilliant. So again, the years kind of um, peeled away to two seventeen, and and then. Lynn and I decided to part company because I felt that where her editing was absolutely brilliant, her marketing didn't quite keep up with the editing. So, yeah, we amicably parted company. And then I had already written a lot of Fields of Grace, a lot of it. So I self-published anyway. So to finish that story, I ended up self-publishing Catch the Moon Mary rather than trying to find another publisher and go through all of that again. I thought it's just it's beautifully edited and it's beautifully, it's perfect. So, you know, self-published with confidence. So, yeah, then I started Fields of Grace, which is the one you've read. Absolutely, absolutely. That's the one I read, and I I, I read the st storyline, I read the plotline of Catch the Moon Mary. I'm equally riveting, and I'm waiting to read that actually. Right. I, I noticed that uh, one common feature with all your uh, novels seems to be music. I I, I know that. Uh, of, course. of course, of course. <laughs> and inspiration. Would Would you like to talk about uh, why there is so much music, or why music is a constant feature in your work? Um, music has been my go-to ever since I was a child. Um, if I do, I do suffer like a lot of creative people. I have depression and, um, music seems to be one of the very few things that pulls me out of that space, that very dark space that we can go into when we do have depression. And, um, it's a fairly hopeless space and it's quite difficult to trick the mind into um, thinking of anything else other than the negative thoughts and the despair that be can become quite overwhelming. So I've had this ever since I was a child, you know, which is a long time. So, so mu but music, as soon as I could I listen to it, it starts to realign, um, just realign my, my thoughts, my energy, my soul. And I go into that space, which is exactly what I had my heroine in both uh, Fields of Grace <laughs> and Catch the Moon Mary doing. They could escape into that space that music took them to. So the notes, and it's the same with the lyrics too. If I hear music, 
it's evoking an image, it's evoking a space and a place. I can see it very clearly. Um, and I had an incident that um, I will tell you about. One of my, I don't know if you believe in angels or talk to angels at all, but I do. <laughs> I, I, I do believe in them. <laughs> there, there is yeah. that, like, that yeah, trolley yeah. Man, that, that angel must be looking after. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I could possibly be that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I had um, um, stumbled into a, a, a contact or communication with um, one of my, whom I, I believe is a guardian angel. And this was a most extraordinary experience, but I've, I've echoed it a lot in um, Fields of Grace and I've echoed it in Catch Me Mirror because it did actually happen to me. I was um, um, asleep, well, not asleep, but, you know, dozing off and I felt a presence um, which is sometimes signature by by wind, um, by a breeze, by an energetic wind, sometimes signature by perfume. And this presence was signatured by both so I fell to wind and I smelled this glorious perfume and then I knew there was somebody there something or someone and that doesn't worry me at all <laughs> so I sat up I literally it's about two o'clock in the morning it was always witching out you know so I sat up and that particular night now it's never happened before or since this angel um shared a symphony with me and I heard this oh the most exquisite fully orchestrated symphonic music um I just sat there completely spellbound and enchanted um and I, I remember saying, you know, with my mind, you you wrote that, did you? <laughs> Is that yours? And this um, angel said, yes, that's my music, but I share it with you. I haven't got the ability um, to be able to then go to the piano and, you know, steal the whole thing and replicate it. Um, but it doesn't matter. It was a wonderful, wonderful, unique and extraordinary experience. And Again, this, this um, thing with music with me where I do feel the presence of otherness and I do feel the presence of, um, of uh, something bigger than us, something marvellous and extraordinary. And I, I think people do call that God. Um, I don't even know what to call it other than this potential that we have, right. spiritual potential, and where we can go. So to to be in the presence of some marvelous <laughs> angelic composer and just go, I I am enchanted and in awe. I love I love people's genius. I'm in awe of humans that um, that have genius and that do things. You know, I'm always very reverential about it. So it was no great stretch to have an angel share. I think it they're androgynous but I want to say her but her music with me wow. that was wonderful <laughs> so, so that came into fields of grace this experience of heavenly music so you experience yeah in more ways yeah than yeah so it was an easy thing to give that to grace in um in fields of grace and yes it is quite difficult when um for her that only she's the only one hearing this music like like me and I couldn't I, no one else could hear it there is no way I could say to anyone in my family or friends gee what did you think of that piece you know <laughs> I don't know didn't hear it no idea so so it's my special little experience which I treasure and which has found its way into the book right absolutely I, I think that in, in a way um answers this next question that I had for you. Okay. Your novels blended the surreal and the real so seamlessly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, and look, you know, the funny thing is that, and it was the, the the young kids at Oasis, the young people at Oasis, talking about their guardian angels. And at that stage, this is about, you know, 15 years ago, I'd not had that experience myself. So I kept an open mind and um, uh, to hear them talking about this pre- these present, these this presence that um, they were experiencing. And it's always wise to simply say, I believe you. I believe you. Um, I haven't had that experience myself, but I believe you. So now that I've had that experience myself, I realise it in a way um, it's not, uh, how do I put this? It, it's, it doesn't make me anything different from anyone else. It doesn't make me a sage, a prophet, a saint, an angel. It, it's the most normal, natural experience that anyone can have. And I think that everybody has these experiences more than they know. Let's just put it that way. So, yes, I put it in that it's seamless. It's, you know, when you get that sense of deja vu, I think I've been here before and know that person. Yeah, you have. And you do. And it's just that you may not immediately remember well, what is the actual when and who and how, and what was the name, place, date, time, because we like to quantify everything as humans, don't we? We love to, you know, put a numeric value on everything. And sometimes you just can't. You just can't. So to enter that space of connection, which some people do through prayer and meditation. Um, I do it through music, quite simply, evidently. (laughs) But it is normal. It's normal. It's natural. And I would love people to bring that connection out of the temples and mosques and churches and designated um, four walls and bring it into their everyday life I would love people to do that if I leave this earth if I can give one gift to humanity before I go it's you can do this just bring it into everything bring the magic in bring the spirit in to everything every day and you'll lift everything to another level no there you brought up another level Right. Yeah. And understandably, uh, the protagonist, uh, Grace Pildegill, is your favorite character from Fields of Grace, and understandably so. Which was the I like John too. Yeah. <laughs> I like John. I like Georgina and John. A challenging character uh, to write. In Fields of Grace. In Fields of Grace. Dashiell. Dashiell. Why? Why so? With, um, um, because, as you know, um, he he's a fairly spoiled and unsavory character, and he, I did not want to write him as as an arch demon. I didn't want to write him as a, as a as a devil in you know incarnate. Because everybody's got redeeming features, and I think, um, but I had to find them. <laughs> I literally. What can soften, you know, what can soften this behaviour in this episode and, and giving him um, some moments of real um, vulnerability, particularly in, in the story when you get to Paris and Berlin and then in Australia, he, he becomes quite vulnerable. So, But he was very difficult to write because I wanted to keep him... Um, aggravating and I wanted people to see why Grace was struggling so much um but I also wanted him to to have a heart or at least moments where you could go oh, poor thing so yeah that was quite difficult to write and still keep his edge <laughs> it, and it's a marvelously crafted uh, historical fiction and I must say the, the compelling imagery and the Diction. Mm -hmm. I think the best part of the novel is your choice of diction. So so brilliant and so such unique expressions. The dialogue. (laughs) The dialogue. (laughs) Absolutely, I I really thought so. (laughs) The dialogue was so crisp, so lucid. I know these people. (laughs) 
I know them. This is the, either I know them in my imagination or or I'm basing them on loosely, obviously, on people I've met along the way. You know, it's, I remember these little, as we all do, you, you meet some extraordinary people along the way and the, their turn of phrase and the way they see the world, the way, the way they their belief systems. So that's what I was applying to, particularly the people at um, at Wincott, Wincott House, um, where they all have very distinct and quite um, sad histories. But I've met all these people. I know these people. <laughs> So I, somewhere along the way I've worked for them or I've um, uh, worked with them or I've encountered them or they've been one of my school teachers or one of my drama teachers or, you know, or a friend at work. Yeah, I've met them. So the dialogue um, <laughs> and their turn of phrase comes from them and Grace's parents and my grandparents. Right. That, that's so, that's Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Right, yeah. yeah, that's my grandparents. That's yeah. on my, on my mother's side. My grandparents, yeah, they were exactly like that, exactly like that. My grandfather was always so funny, and um, so it was very easy to write Grace's dad. So he would always say the craziest things. So, so I now request you to do a book reading of um, maybe both actually, uh, Fields of Grace, yes. followed by Catch Mary. Your favorite section from. Uh, Oh, thank you. That's very kind of you. Um, so I have to put my glasses on for this because I can't see without them. I can see. I can see you. You're a bit hazy, but so well because we've been talking about fields of grace. Shall we start yeah, with that? Begin with fields of grace. Like, okay. So here's the cover, and I think you know that was designed by my beautiful friend Dean Michael Rockford. Ah, okay. Yeah. You, you, we seem to have a telepathy. That would have been my next question as to how yeah. you <laughs> There you go. There you go. The covers. Yeah. Oh, I, well, as soon as he showed me that, I just went, <gasps> you know what? Now I'm going to self-publish. Okay, so I'm, I'm actually going to just read a little bit of the prologue of, from each book, because I am a person who loves prologues. You don't need that sticking up. Because that's what I was going to read to you. Most, most riveting. It, it, yeah, it, it really captures you. It makes, makes it the yeah. It sets the tone. A prologue sets the tone. True. So this is the prologue from Fields of Grace. Okay. Devon is full of stories, some of them true, others just goblin tales. My grandmother, Hepzibah Llewellyn, was a child when she first heard about Amberglow, and to her young ears it sounded like a goblin tale. The story went like this. One autumn morning in 1862, a glowing amber-coloured mist rose from the river Dart and drifted into Stoke Gabriel, rusting the frost hoard sills and cobbled lanes of the village and sending the church bell into an ecstasy of peals. Elfrey and clung to the enraptured dome, muffling its sacrilege with his own shivering flesh. Mid-morning, the sun drove the siren mist back into the river and three bewitched farmers followed it. They were found a week later, half a mile downstream, tangled in willow hair, riding the currents like reeds. The storyteller, a pagan like my grandmother, warned her to cast a protection spell if ever she encountered the evil light, for it was surely a harbinger of death. In 1884, my grandmother, a grown woman and newly married, had cause to recall the warning, for one morning she saw a glimmering tangerine fog crouched over the land, brooding like a lost argument. She cast the protection spell over herself and her husband, but neglected to safeguard her brother far away in South Africa where he was raping the Boer republics of its reluctant gold. A Zulu spear pierced his heart that day. My grandmother did not see Amber Glow again until the night of my birth, 14th of April, 1912, when the sky burned molten copper. Terrified the death light would steal my mother or me, she cast the protection spell over both of us. And we survived. But 1,000, 
517 people did not. Terrible news rocked Stoke Gabriel the next day. At 11.40 p.m., the exact moment of my birth, the RMS Titanic hit an iceberg in the North Atlantic Ocean and sank. My grandmother never saw amber glow again, but I did. In Berlin, in 1936, John and I woke to see Askenesian Plaza drowning in a strange orange-coloured fog, and I knew it was amber glow. I cast the spell, calling on the cedar to protect us, but the fairy folk were powerless against an even stronger glamour, the spell that Hitler had cast over Germany. Many people were lost in that dreadful night, John amongst them. And now on the 23rd of September 2009, the new day has an old light, amber glow. I will die today. Prologue. <laughs> Listening to you read is an experience in itself. Amazing. It sets it up. Fabulous. <laughs> yeah, you, you read wonderfully. I, I'm sure you must have heard of that. You must have heard I of used it. to be an actress. <laughs> I used to be an actress many, many, many moons ago. Ganga Din. And I, and like you, I love words too. I think like you, my favorite is Shakespeare. I just oh really? Okay. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, he, he has said it all actually. I mean, yeah. that's very little for us to say. Yeah. Some of oh my goodness. Anyway, sidetracking. So, um, yeah, straight on. Right. Catch so, you, Mary. Okay. This is Catch the Moon Mary. And also, I have to say, this cover was also given to me by a gorgeous, another gorgeous Irish guy called Des Cannon. Now, it's a photograph that he took of um, a statue in a cemetery. And I just, I fell in love with it. It seemed so evocative of an angel and a, and a girl combined in one. Anyway, I've been a bit lucky with my, <laughs> with my covers. Yeah, I, I I, I, I thought you were sitting with designers and designing those covers. No, and, no, and I just get, I get given them. <laughs> I get given them. <laughs> These wonderful people come you to me. You really do have a garden age of your way. I do. I do. Yeah, <laughs> we all do, but I, I've got a lovely one. Okay, so <clears throat> so this is the... Um, now, with, with um, Catch Me Mary, because this girl, Mary, is a composer. Right. And um, all of the um, chapters are titled with a musical title. So instead of prologue, this is called Overture, okay, thematic introduction to an opera or large musical work. So that's Overture. Oh. All right. <laughs> the night was a thin skin of stars and prophecy the full moon unnaturally bright. All evening he'd felt a presence as if someone or something was following him, but when he looked around there was no one there. He was desperate to reach Sydney and take a rest and settle his nerves before embarking on another long, dark night on the wing. I am going mad, creating phantom company. He spoke aloud just to hear another voice. If only I still had a lover in Florence. Florence, where lovely women left windows open for him and artists begged to paint him. How beautiful he was back then. How perfectly swathed in flesh. He posed nude for Michelangelo and da Vinci. His wings a whisper of light at his shoulder blades. A hundred tallow candles burnishing his summoned flesh. Sienna eyes and golden curls. And in those halcyon Renaissance years, he'd enjoyed a little respite from the quest, lingering in Florence, where human genius had reached extraordinary heights in art and architecture. For almost a hundred years, he cast no shadow on earth, sea or cloud, and time moved at a slow, luxurious pace, and his flesh, was a jacket he could don at will. Now it stuck to his soul like sin. Ooh. And I'm going to stop there. Yeah, I'm going to stop there because you know, you know who that is, don't you? 
I, you know that's yeah, you know it's the angel. I, <laughs> and he's in picture. trouble. <laughs> he's in <laughs> trouble. <laughs> he's he's caused a lot of problems for himself. Right. right. Yeah. Well, Which this girl is gonna sort anyway. <laughs> I, I, so so now what is your writing process that when you're working on a novel what is it that you do i mean uh, you have a favorite corner that you go and sit in or uh, <laughs> write every day uh, i grab a space and um i've look my my um uh process uh begins after the discipline so what i had to learn what i've learned to do because i used to be working full time not so much now with covid and it's all changed now but i would get up at 4:30 in the morning and i would write before work until you know until like half, like eating breakfast and writing you know it's so healthy <laughs> and then go to work and i was waitressing um for about 10 years so i was actually um Yeah, I was lucky in that I had a day a day gig, a day job, so I was waitressing 5 days a week and and Saturday afternoon. So yeah, I'd get up at 4:30 in the morning, I'd work till I had to go open the restaurant at I'd open the restaurant at 8 and then work through till 5. then I go home yeah 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 it's a long day it's a lot of coffees to make i'll tell you um so go home have a shower eat dinner and write till 10 o'clock and that was my process for almost 10 years that's that's marvelous yeah. dedication yeah and i think that's what you've got to do and for a while i was teaching creative writing i was teaching it online and what you know my students would say to me um so oh i look if i had a dollar i would be rich if for every student or person who said to me i only write when i've got inspiration no you don't <laughs> you write when you've got time you write when you've got time and i'll tell you and i said to them you know don't wait for inspiration you'll be waiting forever forever inspiration for me kicks in after about 15 minutes of writing and um it, if i'm lucky and that's a good day but if it's a bad day i write anyway mm. anyway because i can always come back and polish i can always come back and perfect the sentence and find a better way of saying it you know a better way of expressing it that's and the, and then you can relax you've got the story out you've got your 120,000 words or whatever it is. You've got that done. Then you can go back and polish, but don't wait. It's like climbing a mountain, you know, people say, "Oh, I'm looking up at the top of the mountain's too high." Start. You're Start. right, you're right. Yeah. So oh, you know, that's why it's you start at the bottom when you go up. Oh, dear. What's the Chinese saying? A, a thousand mile journey starts with a single footstep. So the Chinese a brilliant Chinese proverb say yeah it's true it starts with a single footstep so yeah i i don't my only process is i make myself right um at the moment i've got a sequel um to both these books which i've rolled into i've rolled into one book so i've taken some of the characters from fields of grace and some from catch the moon yeah i've married them <laughs> <laughs> that way you get them all in <laughs> oh dear and that's that's finished it's done and now it's waiting for me to polish so i'm up to the polishing process and some wonderful creature somewhere will will probably materialize a cover right the way they do you know the way they do Yes, I sense that it's going to be a hard week then. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's yeah. very interesting. So have you ever hit a roadblock, a writer's block? Um look, I don't panic about it. Um I yeah, I, we all do. I mean obviously, yeah, we do. But I don't panic about it. Um 
because again, it's 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 the same relationship with inspiration. If if I hit writer's block, we're going. Oh, I just don't know. I don't know what these characters are going to do next, or I don't know where they're going to go. Um, I I've made myself just go into my existing manuscript. I don't know this sounds silly. I make myself write one more word, one more word, <laughs> and that one more word. Once I've forced myself to do that, will often trigger the next part of the of the book. So it's just just one more word. That's and I say that to myself as I'm sort of forcing myself into the chair and opening up the computer. I say, you know, you only have to do one word. That's and then you can go and relax and do anything you want. One word. So yeah, that's how I deal with writer's block. I make myself do that's it. That's a great way to deal with it. And then. I'm sure more people will will be inspired to do that now. <laughs> wrong with what has what has been the best compliment you've got so far? Which has been your most treasured compliment? Oh look, my most treasured compliment. That's that's easy hands down. It's Sarah Sampson, and, and um, Sarah Sampson is um, a, a reviewer based again based in the UK. I seem to have a lot of fortune in the UK, and she's this beautiful young woman um, who reviews, she's a marketing expert actually, but she reviews books as well. And she, I had trepidatiously, as we do, um, asked her if she would review Catch the Moon Mary and she agreed, which, oh, wow, okay. So she did. And then she came back and she really loved it or she was she was very kind, five stars. So she said, look, I've actually bought Fields of Grace. I've actually got it of my own volition and I'm going to review it. And I was like, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> She's going to hate it. But she came back and said, um, it's my favourite historical novel, uh, probably for 2020. And, and then she said, this is, a, and I've actually got it in my diary. I sometimes just put it above my computer too. This is a searingly beautiful love letter to the arts. So that's Sarah Sampson, the book whiskers. And anybody who can get their book reviewed by her, try. Peter Donnelly is another wonderful person, by the way, just plugging book reviewers. He, he's extraordinary. He's very, very, very busy, though. He's got a huge TBR pile. It's quite hard to get into him, but Sarah, and, and Sarah has too, but if she really likes you, she you, know, you might be able to get in. Well worth it. So searingly beautiful love letter to the arts. Fields of grace. I love it. I love it. Good sense, isn't it? I couldn't have thought of that. <laughs> so she's clever. Yeah, she's eloquent. And I loved your TED talk too, just spinning around here for a minute. And I watched that um, when Brian first introduced or well, introduced you the idea of you into my into my existence. Um, I watched your TED talk on language, and oh, that was just absolutely stunning, Thank gorgeous. You. You're so eloquent and so beautiful and so confident. <laughs> On camera, but and also you know your subject. Obviously, you're a professor of literature. Obviously, you know your subject. But it was your love of language came across in that. Thank you so much. That's, that's very good. That's all right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah I, I, I love talking. Uh, evidently, you're very good at it. <laughs> you're very good at it. Yeah. But speaking of living a dream, I, I think you you are. I mean, I mean, what a lovely place you have chosen to live in now. It seems so very blissful, serene. You you have to take a boat to go and do those. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> my yeah. Love of, of overlooking uh, pelicans and he, pelicans, of, of yes, and species like that. <laughs> yeah. And, and I also it, and I also read that uh, you spent your time between uh, London, Paris, and Sydney. Oh, in in my in my ideal world, my daughter has married um, a Frenchman, and yeah, and um, so we, mum or oh, well, the family flew over for the um, for her wedding in two thousand and nineteen, 
so I have a whole new French family um, over there now. And yeah, I fell in love with Paris. I'd already been in love with Paris, but without actually physically seeing it and seeing it was like, oh, that cemented everything. It's it's a timeless city. It's absolutely, I don't want to say frozen in time. That isn't correct. They've inter, they've integrated the modern with the they haven't lost that sense of the Belle Epoque or the 1920s, the diaspora of poets and writers and artists that, and the, that went to, um, to Paris to express themselves more freely than they were able to in their own country. So there was a diaspora in um, the late 1800s. I don't, I don't know the date, but um, with the Belle Epoque, then there was, it was more of the artistic. The artists, painters, right? Yeah, and then in the 1920s came the Ballet Russe from Russia. The writers, more poets, more artists, singers. Oh my goodness, music, everything. Um, a lot of a lot of expat Americans, the famous Americans that we know about. And then in 1945, there or the 1940s, there was yet another diaspora of writers. So. I tell you, they set, they keep alive. They do. You go into, we went into Le Closerie, I don't think I'm going to say this right, but <laughs> Le Closerie de Lilas, and I knew Hemingway and um, Henry Miller had, and um, I can't remember his partner. Anyway, it doesn't matter. So Hemingway and Miller had certainly written there, and they'd actually written there, I mean, Talk about finding your space, they'd written at the table. So I said to the waiter, I, I would like to see um, Hemingway's table. And he said, Ah, oh, yes, <laughs> a writer. I said, Yes, 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 forgive me. <laughs> and he, he took me straight to the bar. <laughs> I'd written in the book that Hemingway had a table because that's what I'd read, that Hemingway actually sat at a table on the sidewalk. And when I actually got there, the, the waiter said, he used to be up at the bar writing. I said, ah, uh, okay. But the feeling, it's like, oh, my goodness me, it's so populated with, with ghosts and spirits and, and, the, and the living art, you know, the living feeling of, of art. And London, again, they've, they've, you love Shakespeare, I love Shakespeare. It's commemorated all throughout London. He is there. He is everywhere. You know, you, you feel you could run into him walking around a corner. And the pubs that he used to frequent, they're still there. They look much as they did, yes. <laughs> and and um, uh, commemorative plaques to him, obviously, to but and they commemorate everybody because they put the blue plaque on doors and you know anybody who's ever become anyone. Van Gogh was in London for a while. Actually, found his plaque down in uh, Ramsgate. I found his plaque on a door. Okay. Yeah. So for people like us, that's very exciting. Absolutely, yeah, so rewarding. Very exciting, yeah. Okay. Oh, my it's goodness. Like living a piece of history. Yes, living. Um, so in an ideal world and obviously in a COVID friend, I would love to spend more time in, now that I have French relatives, I can do it economically in <laughs> France. Yeah, yeah, and I've got loads of friends in London, so I can always find a couch. Always find a couch. Yeah, yeah. So in an ideal world, yes, those three places would spend my time. And so to answer your question, um, Sydney, it, it, look, it's it's still like everywhere, largely um, shut down because of COVID. So to to move slightly out of Sydney. And into a quiet space was a really good idea. It was it was one that was looming anyway, and um, yeah, I'm really I'm really happy I made the move because it's uh, I've, it's so peaceful, it's so peaceful. I don't wake up to traffic noise or planes. Well, certainly no planes going overhead. Yeah, none of that. What if I I'm read about uh, your views on the literary competitions? Um, I quite 
I quite agree with what you're saying that uh, there, there is a possibility of unfairness being involved. Yeah. Would, would you like to yeah. talk about that? I don't want to bag them out too much, um, but uh, my my uh, lit- my writing career really kicked off with a, a huge literary win in two thousand and and seven, and I I was completely completely unknown. Okay, and I entered a Penguin writing contest. Um, we've got a magazine in Australia called the Woman's Weekly, and it was the Penguin Woman's Weekly. A short story contest, and I entered with the short story of that became Fields of Grace. So I'm compl- was and I still am really, but I was particularly completely unknown. So it was a very fair and legitimate win when I when I did win, and um, yeah, the short story was um, was okay. It was okay. I write a lot better now. So it came as a huge surprise to me. Um, At the end of 2019, I thought I'd get some money together, oh, you know, the way we do. And I sure way I thought, well, my writing's improved out of sight in the last 13 years. I entered um, uh, 15 writing contests worldwide, short story contests, and I did not long list in a single one. Didn't long list, didn't short list, obviously, certainly didn't win, but I didn't even long list. And I just thought, hello, what's happened to writing contests, you know, in the last decade and a bit? Um, and when I started to look at the winners, and I am being really mean here, but it just seemed really odd to me that all of the winners seemed to be locals. And these are quite substantial prizes. You know, they're quite substantial. And I thought, well, why are their mates getting the ten to $20,000 prize here or pounds, you know, wherever if it's in the UK? Um, how come <laughs> they're locals? And then I thought, well, I'm going to read the stories. I'm going to read the some of the long-listed stories. I'm going to read the short-listed, and I'm going to obviously read all the winners. And to be honest, I didn't find a single one that I felt was it's exciting. Exceptional. Yeah, exceptional. Not a single one. And I thought, you know what? My favourite one? Who are your favourite writers and uh, what are you present reading? My favourite writers, okay. Um, That's quite a long conversation, but my favourite writers, right? and and we're talking circa 2021, 2020 into 2021. So um, in no particular order, I love, worship and adore Oscar Wilde, Truman Capote, um, Jeanette Winterson, Virginia Woolf, Lord Byron, <laughs> Shakespeare, of course, Shakespeare, of course. Um, and, you know, loving this girl's poetry, this girl. Absolutely. Easy. <laughs> Absolutely. Ah, oh, I keep, like, I read a poem a night. Thank you, miss. Thank you. Um F. Scott Fitzgerald, I I absolutely adore. Um, Daniel Keyes, who wrote Flowers for Algernon. Um, Paul Gallico, I adore the Snow Goose. Um, Antoine de Saint Exupéry, I love the Little Prince. Okay. Oh, who doesn't? That's a <laughs> that's long doesn't. list. Oh, right. What are you reading presently? That's a really long list. <laughs> I, I, I know, I know. That is, I warned you. It would be a really long list. Well, at the moment, I'm reading. Um, I'm reading two books. Um, at the moment, I often do this. Of sort of when I'm in the mood for for one particular style. So I'm reading our dear friend, our lovely friend Brian Quinn's um, No Good Deed Goes Unpunished, and that's the sort of thriller mafia, it's a bad boys book. You know, if I want a bit of bad boys, I read that. So <laughs> I have to be in the mood. And uh, he's 
he's wonderful in that genre. And I'm reading um, Gabriel Blondell. Now, this is an, an Australian writer, and she is absolutely brilliant. And her book is called Numb. It's exquisitely, the, the, um, the prose is very sparse, which is not normally my preferred, but ugh, she is riveting. She is hooking me in. So I'm reading both those books at the moment. So two completely um, different books. Yeah, completely different. And I just finished reading um, a wonderful writer called um, Louise Tremblay. L, uh, she calls herself L.L. Tremblay. It's so L dot, L dot. And she had a book called Seven Roses, and I absolutely loved it because the character is based on her own experiences where she, like, um, she talks to angels and spirits and of course now and now that I've had those experiences some experiences like the one I described to you earlier I go I know <laughs> you're right <laughs> I believe you and that was page turning. Was oh my goodness, what's going to happen next? This is extraordinary. It was such a page turning book. So that was Seven Roses. Okay. That's one to look out for. I'll I'll um, email that to you. Okay. Yeah, fabulous. That's great. Mm. That's great. Yeah. Any any special message for viewers of the Writer Talks? Right. Well, um, my special message, I suppose, is for you. Um, I want to thank you so much for the support and belief that you have and taking this is a massive commitment that you've undertaken and it's a lot of work, I know, because in between you're teaching, <laughs> you're lecturing and you're keeping your life going. So you you take the time out to do this to support other writers and you are a wonderful poet yourself. Yeah. So my message is that while this beautiful young lady is still available, writers, get on her to be interviewed list, make contact, and if she can fit you in, you will be very, very fortunate. Very lucky. Each of you. That's so kind. Thank you so much. That's and so I hope you don't get flooded with flooded with people. Oh my no, god! I, I must honestly thank you and Brian. You introduced me to so many writers, and uh, it, it's been a month. There's more. So there's far. more. <laughs> <laughs> there's more if you want them. If you I, I, I would. I would love to. Yeah. It. And uh, really, thank you. You've been such a brilliant mentor, actually. And Thank you for such kindness. <laughs> and That's thank all you right. for being on the right talks. <laughs> My pleasure. Thank you so much. <laughs>